Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we are looking at a data set of Spotify songs from 1960 until 2019, and we're going to try to predict if a given song will be a hit or not. Uh, so we have the data set down here. We have a different CSV file for each decade, uh, and each song has a track name, artist name, a URI, and then a bunch of features about the song. So we're not going to use the track name, artist name, or URI, but all the rest of the features um, will be used to try to predict whether uh, the song was a hit or not, which is given by this target variable here. All right, so let's hop into the notebook. Um, I'm going to be importing NumPy and Pandas for working with the data, and then we'll use the train test split function and standard scalar uh, from sklearn for pre-processing. Um, so these are the models we're going to use, a bunch of them today. Uh, logistic regression, k nearest neighbors, a decision tree, uh, then two support vector machines, one with a linear kernel, one without a linear kernel, or a nonlinear kernel, um, one uh, neural network, and then two ensemble uh, methods, one being the random forest and the other being gradient boosting. So let's go ahead and import all of that, uh, and I'm going to load in the data frames all at once, just using one line of code. Uh, we can grab the file path for one of them, uh, and we can store all of the data frames in a list called data frames, or DFs, and I'll use list comprehension to uh, load them all in uh, using pandas.readcsv. So I'll paste in the file path for one of them, and you can notice that the only thing that changes between these file paths is the first digit of the decades. So if I just remove that first digit, replace that with decade, and make this into an F string, uh, then we can uh, say for decade in and specify all of the decades we want. So we'll have 6 for the 60s, 7 for the 70s, uh, 8 for the 80s, 9 for the 90s, 0 for the 2000s, whoops, 0 for the 2000s, and 1 for the 2010s. Alright, and we run that, and DFs is now a list of all of our data frames. So if we grab DFs sub 0 to get the first data frame, this will just be the 60s songs, um, if we df sub 1 will be the 70s songs, and so on. So I will, uh, I'm not sure why the year that the uh, song was released is not in the data set. Uh, that's fine, if we really wanted to go, um, if, we, if we really wanted to uh, be thorough here, we could actually maybe query the Spotify API using this URI here uh, to try to extract the year feature. Um, or maybe some others as well. However, um, I'm not going to do that. Um, but we can get the decade uh, because they are separated into uh, CSV files with the decade name in them. We can just uh, sort of go through the, each of these data frames and put on a new feature called decade uh, to each one. So for that, what I'll do is uh, I'll say for I'll, I'll first I'll say for decade in. And I'll just put the first year of every decade, so 1960, uh, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2010. And then I want to enumerate this list. So for I and decade in enumerate the list, um, I'm going to take the ith data frame uh, and create a decade column on it that contains a panda series with values given by decade. Uh, and the index for this series will be the same as uh, the index of DFs sub i. So uh, for each one of these data frames, we're going to add the corresponding uh, decade year. So I run this, and we take a look at DF sub 1 again. Uh, you can see at the end, we have the decade column, and this is 1970. Uh, if we did DF sub 4, we would have 2000. So uh, now that we have the decades for each um, for each uh, data frame, let's concatenate all the data frames together using pandas.concat. So uh, we'll store all of the data frames concatenated into data, and we'll get that with pd.concat uh, dfs. So we'll, let's just see what this looks like. Um, we want to specify the axis along which we want to concatenate, which is axis 0, which means on top of each other. Um, and you can see we now have 41,000 rows 
Um, a given one of these, uh, I can see actually here, uh, if we look at df sub zero, this one had 8,000. Uh, so they're all together now into one big data frame uh, with 41,000 rows. Um, and the only thing here is that they're, they're not shuffled up. Uh, all the 1960s are at the front, the 2010s are at the end, because they they all go in order because I just concatenated them. So afterwards, I'm going to sample the data frame. I'm going to sample 100% of the data uh, without replacement, which is the same as just a random shuffle. And since it is random, I'm going to include a random state here uh, so we can reproduce the results. And now if we look at the end, um, we have the decades all shuffled up. So uh, the last thing I want to do is just reset these indices because now that we've shuffled them, they've gotten all out of order. So we can use reset index to do that. And I'm going to specify drop equals true uh, to avoid the old indices from becoming uh, a new column. All right, so that should take care of it. You can see the indices are nice now. And let's store this in data. All right. All right, so here it is. Here's data. And now we can do our pre-processing on data. So before we actually do the pre-processing, I just want to check if we have any missing values. Uh, and we do not. We have the maximum number of non-nulls in every column. <coughs> we also only have these three object columns, which are uh, the ones at the beginning, which, like I said, I, we will be dropping. So let's start pre-processing now. Um, as usual, I'm going to create a pre-process inputs function uh, that's going to take in a data frame, make a copy of the data frame, and return the data frame. Uh, and this can just allow us to modify a fresh copy of the data for pre-processing. So we'll store the processed version of the data in X, and we'll pass data into our function to get it. Uh, so X is right now just a copy of data, and this is the copy we will be uh, applying our transformations to. So uh, let's drop these tracks, uh, these uh, columns first. So the track, artist, and URI columns we're going to drop. Uh, and the reason uh, we're dropping these ones, I already explained, well, URI isn't of much use in its current state. If we wanted to, we can maybe use this to query the Spotify service for more information. Um, but we're going to drop it because, I mean, obviously each one of these is a unique identifier, and therefore th they, the column provides no way to draw similarities bef between examples in the data set. Um, for the other two, track and artist, um, if we look at the number of unique values in each one, so if I take the length of x sub track dot unique, um, there's 35,000 unique values, and these are also sort of uh, unique identifiers uh, for the um, for the examples. So they also uh, provide no way to make to draw similarities between uh, examples. And if we look at the artist, um, this doesn't have quite as many. Um, however, it is too high. Uh, the cardinality is too high of this column. Um, because the standard way to encode uh, such columns, which are nominal features, would be with one hot encoding. And we can see what that will do with pandas.getDummies. Let's, let's take the artist column and try to get dummy columns for it. Um, so here you can see the dummy columns. Each unique artist ha gets its own column. And we'd have a one in a given example uh, if the song belonged to that artist. Um, now, the only issue here is that we now have 11,904 of these new columns. And if we were to add these 11,000 columns onto our data, well, we just have um, just so many columns, it would slow down training so much. Um, so maybe if you really, really wanted to squeeze every bit of, of accuracy out of your model and you didn't care at all about uh, computational requirements and time, uh, maybe you could leave these on. Uh, but in but yeah, I'm going to drop it, uh, definitely. So we're dropping all these three, track, artist, and URI. So up here I'll say uh, drop high cardinality categorical columns. And we'll say df.drop, pass in track, uh, artist, and URI. And we're dropping from axis 1, which is the column axis. So down here you can see they're gone. We now only have 17 columns. Um, but 
Uh, luckily, all of these columns are uh, numeric and properly encoded. I was a bit concerned about maybe the key it was just randomly identified, uh, randomly assigned integers, but these are actually, I looked into the description, these are actually pitch values, uh, and it does go in uh, the proper order. Uh, the time signature also, uh, I was afraid that maybe uh, it wasn't done, I don't know, I didn't know how it was encoded, but this actually just represents the number of beats uh, in a measure. So um, this is also just sort of a count feature. So we don't have to do anything, any sort of a encoding to these features. Mode is just a binary feature, that's fine, uh, minor or major. And then uh, everything else is also numeric. So the target is what we're trying to predict. So why don't we split the target off from the rest of the data? So Y is going to be the target. Uh, we'll just take the target column, store that in Y, and then X will be the, all the rest of the data. So df.drop target for max is 1. Um, and then we'll do our train test split. So we're going to use the train test split function from sklearn. That's going to take in X and Y. Um, and it's going to split. It's going to split them so that 70% of the rows go into the train set, and the other 70 and the other 30% go into the test set. So we can specify that split here with train size. I'll pick 70%. Um, then we will in, will include shuffle equals true. Uh, this is on by default, um, and we did shuffle earlier, but uh, it's nice to get a fresh shuffle. Not really that it matters so much in this case. Um, and then we'll include a random state as well, since the shuffle uh, is a random process, and we want to be able to reproduce the results. So this uh, will return four new sets of the data, x train, x test, y train, and y test. And those are the four sets I want to return from this function. So I'll, I'll return them here, I'll get them back here, and then we can take a look at x train. So the X-Train is now 70% of the original data, and it does not contain the target column. Uh, that will be stored in Y-Train and Y-Test. Um, and the last thing I'm going to do is split, uh, is scale the data. So right now, if we look at the mean of each column, uh, they're all over the place. Uh, and if we look at the variances, they're all over the place as well. Uh, not as much as usual, though. They are quite similar. Uh, actually, not, not really. This one's quite high. Um, so we're going to use standard scaling, which will give each column a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. Um, and for that, we're going to use a standard scaler uh, from sklearn. Now scaling can help the performance of many models. Um, uh, it, it, it just ensures that the, the range of values in each column is very similar. Uh, across all columns. So we can fit the scalar to our train set and just the train set because we sort of want to pretend we don't have access to the test set when we're doing the pre-processing. Um, and then we're going to transform the train set using scalar.transform on it. Uh, and this actually returns a numpy array so if I run this you'll see we it has been scaled but we can't see it in a nice data frame anymore. So let's go in and turn this back into a data frame and include the indices uh, to be the same as they were before and the column names to be the same as they were before. Alright, and we'll copy this over and do exactly the same thing for x-test. Oh, hold on. So we fit only to the train set, but we're both we're transforming both x-train and x-test. Okay, and there is the skilled data. So if we look at the means of each column now, they're all really close to zero, and the variances are all really close to one. So, uh, we're ready to, to train. Whoops. Okay. Um, right, so for the sake of time, I'm just going to copy in this dictionary. Uh, it's mapping the name of the model to the instance of the model uh, for each of the models that we imported earlier. Uh, and this way we can train them all with just one for loop for name and model in models.items. Uh, models.items, uh, the items uh, function from a dictionary will return the keys and values as tuples so you can iterate through 
two at a time like this. And then uh, model.fit on the train set here. Uh, so X train, Y train. And we'll just print out a little confirmation uh, message that says the model was trained. All right, we'll run that um, and see when it finishes. All right, so all the models have been trained uh, and we're now going to take a look at the results. So we can also do this with just a nice for loop uh, for name and model in models.items. Uh, we can print out the accuracy value for a given uh, model. So we can get the accuracy value with model.score. Uh, we pass in the test set. Uh, it will make predictions on the test set and then compare those to the Y test to get an accuracy value. Uh, I want to print this out uh, with the name of the model and I want to display the accuracy value to two decimal places with the percent sign afterwards and format that with model.score. And I do want to multiply by 100 since I am showing it as a percentage. All right, and we can see it coming through uh, one at a time. Logistic regression did quite well. I mean, uh, not too bad, right? Uh, predicting hits might not be such an easy task. Getting a 75 percent accuracy is quite good. Uh, looks like the tree model performed slightly worse, and here they all are now. Um, it looks like our more complex models uh, did better in this situation. Um, especially the difference between the SVMs, one with a linear, one with a radial basis function kernel, it definitely seems like um, there is a nonlinear relationship between our feature, uh, feature data and uh, the targets. Um, because the linear kernel is performing much, uh, well, uh, at least noticeably uh, worse than the RB RBF kernel. Um, and these all sort of did the same. Um, it looks like the random forest came in first, which is interesting because our single decision tree uh, was actually the worst model. And our random forest, which is just a an aggregation of decision trees uh, built in parallel, and then there's a majority vote at the end to uh, make the final classification. Um, this was actually our best performing model. So it's interesting to see. Um, Alright, and that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.